been thinking this since no later than Sunday afternoon. I have been thinking that there will come a point this year, this election, maybe this month, where we will all be standing here saying, can you believe we came this close to not making Vice President Harris the nominee? You have heard the poll, Ipsos, for Reuters, Harris 42, Trump 38, Kennedy H in the three-party race, and Harris 44, Trump 42 head-to-head. A four-point shift to Kamala Harris in one week. But have you heard the other polls? Marist for NPR and the PBS NewsHour, Harris 42, Trump 42, Kennedy 7, Trump 46, Harris 45. YouGov for Yahoo News, Harris 46, Trump 46. These numbers are from, at the latest, the first full day of the Harris campaign. There are voters who do not know she is going to be the Democratic nominee for president. Could be a million of them could be 20 million of them. It is hard to say, and she is already in a statistical tie. And yet, the most jaw-dropping poll is none of these. It is from a state. And I had to look up the pollster, whereupon my jaw dropped a second time in the same poll. Georgia, conducted Monday. Trump 48, Harris 47 by Landmark Communications. And who in the hell is Landmark Communications? Oh my God, it's a Republican internal pollster in Georgia. From its website, Mark Roundtree is president of Landmark Communications, which he founded in 1991. He's been professionally engaged, has run more than 2,000 different Georgia elections, including statewide, congressional, legislative, and local campaigns and elections magazine. I let my subscription lapse. Campaign and Elections Magazine has recognized Mark as one of Georgia's five top influencers, as well as, quote, the go-to man for GOP legislative candidates. Landmark regularly polls Georgia and is rated an A-minus grade by 538.com. Sweet Jesus on hockey skates. Kamala Harris trails Trump in Georgia by one, according to the leading Republican pollster. The last Trump-Biden poll there earlier this month, Trump by four. June, Trump by five. January, Trump by eight. Also, back to the national polls, Marist. What is your impression of Kamala Harris? Registered voters, Monday, favorable, 44, unfavorable, 46. So she's two points underwater. That sounds meh. Trump is 19 points underwater. 19. Joe Biden is 18 points underwater. Kamala Harris, minus two. We join the Trump campaign in full-fledged poll panic, frantically lowering the bar already in progress. A memo at midday yesterday from Tony Fabrizio, Trump pollster, who now works at MAGA Inc., even though Trump tried to stiff him for $767,000 it owed him from polling during the 2016 campaign. Part of his memo, quote, Many of you have heard me refer to the upcoming Harris honeymoon that I expect to see in the public polling over the next couple of weeks, he wrote an hour before it began. As I've explained, the honeymoon will be a manifestation of the wall-to-wall coverage Harris receives from the MSM. The coverage will be largely positive and will certainly energize Democrats and some other parts of their coalition, at least in the short term. That means we will start to see public polling, particularly national public polls, where Harris is gaining on or even leading Trump. Obviously, the situation we find ourselves in today is totally uncharted territory and has no modern historical parallel, but there are some things that haven't changed. Due to the events of the past two weeks, including our highly successful convention, did you see the speech, Tony? President Trump has seen a bump in his numbers in a number of recent public polls. Not surprising, given that most candidates historically receive some type of bump. Given what has happened over the past couple of days and her impending VP choice, there is no question that Harris will get her bump earlier than the Democrats' convention. And that bump is likely to start showing itself over the next few days. 
tick, 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 it was 45 minutes later, and will last a while until the race settles back down. The Democrats and the MSM, Fabrizio writes, will try and tout these polls as proof that the race has changed, but the fundamentals of the race stay the same. The Democrats deposing one nominee for another does not change voters' discontent over the economy, inflation, crime, the open border, housing costs, not to mention concern over two foreign wars. Before long, Harris's honeymoon will end and voters will refocus on her role as Biden's partner and co-pilot. Co-pilot is the funniest word I've ever heard used as an attempt to slur somebody. So Trump's convention bump and the somebody nearly shot him with a paperclip, no, 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 a bullet bump, they're already baked in here. But it's Harris who has the honeymoon at the moment. Here's the graveyard, and right next to it, here's Team Trump whistling past it. Because there's one little thing Tony left out of his memo. Did you notice? One small detail that we can now stop wasting so much of our energy, devoting so much of this campaign to denying and finessing and finding the very real silver linings while trying to deprioritize the equally real thunderstorm clouds that contain them. Nowhere in the Trump internal polling memo is a reference to that pesky little age thing. I wonder, did anybody poll the new campaign between Trump and Harris on the age thing? Oh, look, here it is. It's Ipsos for Reuters. Thank you, God, for Ipsos for Reuters. Monday and some yesterday. Do you agree or disagree that 78 years old Trump is too old to work in government? Agree, 53%. Disagree, 43%. But wait, there's more. Do you agree or disagree Kamala Harris is mentally sharp and able to deal with challenges? Agree 56%, disagree 37%. Check, please. Now, polls change, and Tony, the unpaid Trump pollster, is right about honeymoons and bumps and fundamentals, and, and though he didn't mention it in the memo, the fact that you always should get Trump to pay you up front. But the reason I began to say that we would soon be saying, can you believe we came this close to not making Vice President Harris the nominee, was not about those polls, which bluntly are unforeseeably great, bump or no bumps, and honeymoons or no honeymoons. No, this is about something else. I actually first felt a version of this question before the debate, the same time I heard for the first time in perhaps a year Vice President Harris give a speech. I had stopped listening to her speeches, and I'll explain why in a moment. But first, this is the candidate yesterday throwing out the opening pitch on opening day in Milwaukee. Before I was elected to the United States Senator, I was elected Attorney General of the state of California, and I was a courtroom prosecutor before then. And in those roles, I took on perpetrators of all kinds. Predators who abused women, fraudsters who ripped off consumers, cheaters who broke the rules for their own gain. So hear me when I say, I know Donald Trump's type. Not in my lifetime have I heard a public speaker improve that much, that late, relatively, in their career. Where she was tentative and even diffident, Kamala Harris is now excited to get to the punchline. And now she knows how to throw the punch when she gets there. And one small but significant technical improvement. She used to click. There used to be a little mouth noise, a clicking sound during her pauses, as often as every 10 seconds or so, just enough to drive you crazy within minutes. 
I heard it during the 2019-2020 primary season, and I thought she could never get elected. The click, in short order, becomes all you can hear. The click is gone. I don't know what she did. I don't know if it was conscious. I don't know if they worked on it for two years. It's gone. The click is gone, and honestly, I think so are Trump's chances. Famous last words I know. These poll numbers could be a honeymoon, though, uh, tell me, when was the last American political honeymoon? Maybe Obama? Maybe? I mean, in the late primaries? It could be just a bump, or it could be this other thing that we tended to discount much of this year. It could be the voters who have been screaming at everybody, we told you we didn't want either of them. We told you we wanted somebody younger, almost anybody younger. Oh, thanks, there's somebody younger. If that's what this is, this could be a Democratic landslide. Can you believe we came this close to not making Vice President Harris the nominee? By the way, a postscript. I think the polls that Nancy showed President Biden, Nancy Pelosi, that is. Sure, there were the polls about how he was losing all the swing states and creating new swing states and the national polls. I think she also showed him ones that we have not yet seen, that look like those hypotheticals I quoted last week in which we go from Biden down five in the swing states to somebody else up seven, only it's not some imaginary somebody else. In the ones I think Pelosi showed Biden, it's Kamala somebody else Harris who's up by seven in the swing states or can be. Oh, and she probably also showed Joe Biden fundraising expectations. And my God, it just keeps coming. Plus, now there are Harris jokes, good Harris jokes about Harris fundraising. I don't see an official update as I record this. I expect that the $223,000 a minute clip will have leveled off somewhat. But we did get this in the inbox, quote, over $100 million raised for Kamala. That was sent by J.D. Vance. Thanks, J.D. By the way, that was $100 million as of hour 36. The fundraising jokes, two I wanted to mention from the comedian Paul Rudnick. Kamala raises any more money, Melania will marry her. Good. From Heather Thomas, Kamala Harris has raised so much money, Clarence Thomas wants to vacation with her. Oh. We had another example of the media being too stupid for words. Talk about jokes. A debate, a Harris-Trump debate. The headline at the website, The Hill, Trump commits to debating Harris, would be willing to do more than one. In point of fact, as the story reveals, Trump was uncommitting from the scheduled debate against Harris on ABC in September and committing to other hypothetical ones but only on his terms. In other words, they got the story entirely incorrect. Quote, I have at least equal say, and I don't like the idea of ABC, Trump told reporters on a press call. I would be willing to do more than one debate, actually. But he added that he had not agreed to anything as far as to a debate with Harris. I agreed to a debate with Joe Biden. Why don't you go do that? Maybe they'll put it on radio. I agreed to a debate with Joe Biden, but I want to debate her. They have the same policies. I think debating is important for a presidential race. I'm only 78 and a half years old. My name is Elmer J. Fudd Millionaire. I own a mansion and a yacht. I was suggest to this crazy old man that he take whatever terms he can get in a debate because it may shortly be clear, even to him, in his addled state of mind, that his only chance is if she bothers to debate him. Now, happily, in the background, it's not like the Republican rank and file is panicking or anything. From Politico, House Republican leaders told lawmakers to focus on criticizing Harris's record without reference to her race and gender 
following caustic remarks from some Republicans attacking her on the basis of identity. 100% is some, right? 100%. During a closed-door meeting yesterday, Chair of the House GOP campaign arm Richard Hudson and others issued the warning after a series of comments by their members that focused on Harris's race, as well as claims she is a, quote, DEI pick, according to two people in the room. Speaker of the House Mike Johnson, who is really dumb, this should not be about personalities. It should be about policy. And we have a record to compare. DEI? You're trying to get them to not say DEI? I mean, what is it? It's a week since the Trump crony Sebastian Gorka called Kamala Harris, quote, colored, unquote. And you're trying to stop them from saying DEI? You are telling your collection of white supremacist morons not to call her DEI? Well, guess what? Here's a shock. They're not listening to you, Richard Hudson, Mike Johnson. They're listening to Sebastian Gorka. This is Harriet Hageman, who primaried and beat Liz Cheney, and who is, as widely noted, well, maybe also George Santos. When George Santos is dressed up as Katara Ravache. Dead ringers. They're dead ringers for one another. Also, as you listen to Harriet, George, Katara Ravache, Santos, Hagman. To get the full flavor of the thing, of, of what she means, imagine at the end that she does not say DEI, but what she and the others really want to say, that she's saying the N-word. Well, I think she's one of the weakest candidates I've ever seen in the history of our country. Uh, I, I mean, intellectually, just really kind of the bottom of the barrel. Uh, I think she was a DEI hire, and I think that that's what we're seeing, and I just don't think that they have anybody else. I just think that they're in real disarray. Woo! One of them's going to do it. I predicted it yesterday. Before the end of the month, somebody's going to use an actual racial epithet. They're not going to stop at DEI. We can't call her DEI? Oh, how about this other word here that starts with a... No, not that. No, 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 no. How about these initials? JD. Can we call her a JD? Oh, my goodness. Is there JD Vance Byers remorse on the Republican side of the ball? I can't tell if he's inflated or stuffed or both. He's not making a good impression. Also, there's the little matter of CNN breaking the story that he uh, repeatedly indicated in 2016 that he believed Donald Trump had committed sexual assault. CNN reported that Vance appeared on an MSNBC segment in October that year on Trump's alleged misconduct, sexual misconduct, in which an interview with Jessica Leeds who accused Trump of groping and forcibly kissing her during a flight in the 1970s. The tape was played. Vance said it was hard to believe Trump's denials. Quote, at a fundamental level, this is sort of a he said, she said, right? And at the end of the day, Trump's vice presidential nominee, J.D. Vance, said, do you believe Donald Trump, who always tells the truth? Just kidding. Or do you believe that woman on the tape? Can they have another convention since that last convention went so so well for them and pick somebody else? Anybody else? Anybody know where Mike Pence is at the moment? <laughs> Hello, I'm Vice President Mike Pence for the Trump-Pence 2024 campaign. I know, I know. You're asking why. One more item here, Trump and the magic bullet. This is finally sneaking into the mainstream. Again, a CNN piece, not on the air. On the website, Sanjay Gupta writes, although the images we've seen of Trump since his attempted assassination have been those of a person who was barely injured and is now in high spirits, what we've been told by the campaign offers very little insight into the former president's condition, what kind of care he received, or how his medical team will monitor him in the days and weeks ahead. Oh, really? I hadn't noticed this. A full public assessment of Trump's injuries is necessary for both the former president's own health 
Yeah, okay. And the clarity it can provide for voters about the recovery of the man who could become president of the United States once again. The concern is that gunshot blasts near the head can cause injuries that aren't immediately noticeable, such as bleeding in or on the brain, damage to the inner ear, or even psychological trauma. His head is not big enough to contain any more psychological trauma. This has to be it. He is already the craziest man in public discourse in the United States, certainly North America, probably the entire hemisphere. Oh, he might have a little bit more psychological trauma. Well, then, he'll be an axe murderer by the end of the week. As a trauma neurosurgeon, I have seen how a thorough evaluation after any kind of gunshot wound can provide a complete picture and lead to a speedier recovery. Sanjay, spoiler alert, it wasn't a bullet. Bottle cap, piece of plastic, possibly a very old hard gum ball. Why are they keeping this a secret? Because they can't face the idea. One particular aspect, apart from the martyrdom, apart from the he can stop a bullet with his bare ear, apart from the he took a bullet from democracy, all of these lines that would instantly vanish if there were, in fact, open proof that he was hit by some sort of debris, even though to you and I, they tried to kill him. And he got hit by something, and it opened up a wound on his ear. And if he just played it straight, we couldn't have said anything about it. We couldn't have mocked him for it. We couldn't have accused him of exaggerating it. We couldn't have used it against him. And here he has created this entire situation simply by not telling the truth. If people shoot at you and you are running for president of the United States and other people get killed and wounded because of those bullets and you get hit by some sort of essentially improvised shrapnel, that counts. That was an assassination attempt. That was an assassination attempt by gun. That counts. But they can't let it happen that way because of one line that would result. The idea that when Trump dived under that podium, he was diving to get out of the way of a bottle cap. They cannot face the idea that Trump would have had to dive under the podium unless it was a bullet. What if it wasn't a lethal threat to him? What if it had hit him in the back of the head, whatever it was, and it wasn't a bullet, even if the other bullet in that photograph whizzed right past him and didn't strike him, and he got hit by some sort of debris struck somewhere along the way by that bullet or some other bullet? We don't see the difference. They are living and dying over it. It could become something that would do as much damage to the Trump campaign as Kamala Harris is doing to the Trump campaign. And I'll explain to you again from my personal experience where this comes from. In this kind of reptile mind that is at the back of every Republican candidate and voter. In September of 2006... I received a package of fake anthrax in my mail at home. From the beginning, it was obvious it was fake anthrax, except what if it wasn't? I knew, because I happened to be at that moment on antibiotics, that I was not going to get anthrax, let alone die from it. But the building was full of 93-year-old ladies. What if the one in a billion chance were true that it was anthrax and somehow somebody dealing with anthrax who did not kill themselves while dealing with anthrax managed to put anthrax in the mail to me? What if that happened? And the 93-year-old ladies all got it and died, which is exactly the scenario that took place in the actual anthrax attacks after 9-11, in the early winter of 2001, including one at the Rupert Murdoch paper, the New York Post. But because it was not actually anthrax, and when I called the Department of Homeland Security and a wonderful exhibition of your tax dollars in action was played out in front of me as hazmat suit after hazmat suit marched through my apartment and the apartments adjoining and they finally ordered me into the ambulance at threat of arrest to spend the night being checked for anthrax just in case on the same premise that i had called them just in case after that was 
leaked to the New York Post when the FBI asked me not to report it so they could get a head start on finding the guy who did it. And ultimately they did, as I have described here in previous episodes. This fake anthrax attack was very much a terrorist act, and the man who did it and sent similar packages to others and ultimately sent me four different packages of fake anthrax went to prison. I believe it was for three years. I think he still has a parole officer or at least a probation officer, and he literally lived in his mother's basement in Southern California and thought the two most beautiful women in the world were Laura Ingram and Ann Coulter. But what was the reaction to this? This was exactly what the New York Post, when it was leaked to them, wrote. MSNBC, oh, the headline, Powder Puff Spooks Keith. Not something about how taking precaution here. MSNBC loudmouth Keith Olbermann flipped out when he opened his home mail yesterday. The acerbic was terrified when he opened a suspicious looking letter with a California postmark and a batch of white powder poured out. A note inside warned Olbermann, who's a frequent critic of President Bush's policies, that it was payback for some of his on air shtick. The caustic commentator panicked and frantically called 911 at about 12.30 a.m., sources told the Post's Philip Messing himself. Is that Philip Messing? That's Philip Messing himself. An NYPD hazmat unit rushed to Olbermann's pad, but preliminary tests indicated the substance was harmless soap powder. However, that wasn't enough to satisfy Olbermann, who insisted on a checkup. As I pointed out, no. I, I said, why do, you have to, why do I have to go to the hospital all night? Just in case. I'm like, okay, what if I don't? We'll arrest you under public health charges. He asked to be taken to St. Luke's Hospital, where doctors looked him over and sent him home. Whether they gave him a lollipop on the way out isn't known. Olbermann had no comment. Imagine the right-wing media having to deal with the reality that Donald Trump was not hit by a bullet, but was hit by, I don't know, fake anthrax. Harmless soap powder, a lollipop, debris from an assassin's bullet is not to them the same as an assassin's bullet. Ultimately, this Christ-like act by Trump taking a bullet for democracy, suddenly that turns into powder puff spooks Trump. And that's why they are doing this, and why Trump continues to hide the real story of how his ear got nearly fatally scratched. Don't you say it wasn't real? Don't you say it wasn't a real bullet? He didn't just, he didn't dive and hide under that, under that lectern because he, he, he was a bullet. He was almost dead. In fact, his head came off. I saw him put his head back on. He stitched it himself. He's Jesus. But let us not get lost in the conservative weeds. Kamala Harris, first full day on the camp, first full day on the campaign, thrown in at the last minute. The award-winning actor can't perform. You have to go on. A Star is Born, starring Kamala Harris. First day, out of the box with an epic speech, a declaration of war on Trump in said speech, millions more in donations, and of course, ahead in the Reuters poll, a point back in the Georgia poll, approval poll numbers 17 points better than Trump to start with. Polling, 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 poll. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Oh, Nancy, same melody, different lyrics. Polling, 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 keep those numbers rolling, get them margins swollen, vice pres. Day three on the stump, already kicking Trump. He wants to see the manager and sue. Two points atop the matchup, now make sure he don't catch up. Remember, don't vote for the old guy. Thank you, Nancy Faust.
theme from Rahind. Also of interest here, so another Republican elected official has threatened civil war. Only this one tried to take it back, and he says, we all need to watch our words. Dude, you, you said that if you didn't get your way and the Republicans did not win the election, you would start a civil war with your little guns. The government has all the tanks and the jets and the government the government's the government's run by democrats we all need to watch our words bullshit dude you need to watch your words that's next this is countdown this is countdown with keith oberman Still ahead of us on this edition of Countdown, I slammed Aaron Sorkin yesterday for his classic and perfectly timed New York Times op-ed Sunday morning that yes, Joe Biden should step aside to be replaced by Mitt Romney. I mentioned that Aaron Sorkin had over the years gone from being a friend who I admired and who apparently admired me to a guy who admired me too much and started borrowing stuff from me, like my career all the stories in it for free. If you don't know that story, let me tell you of the day I heard my own father's favorite phrase come out of the mouth of Aaron Sorkin's lead character in things I promised not to tell. First, there are still more new idiots to talk about. The daily roundup of the miscreants, morons, and Dunning-Kruger effect specimens who constitute today's worst persons in the world the bronze valentina gomez the 25 year old colombian born anti-immigration candidate for secretary of state in missouri anti-immigration because of course she is she's here already why do we need other immigrants valentina does videos usually with weapons and she's often seen wearing a size 7 MAGA hat, even though her head seems to be about a 4. Recently, this Gomez attacked Missouri State Senator Barbara Pfeiffer, who has a trans grandchild. As they reported, the tension escalated when Gomez launched a personal attack on Pfeiffer via social media. You have a trans grandchild, she wrote. That means you raised a groomer. You failed your children, and they failed your grandchildren. Also, you're irrelevant, and you belong in a nursing home. Pfeiffer is, and has been for 40 years, a Methodist minister. Her response, it's concerning any time a person attacks a child. Attacks on children have no place anywhere on anything. Ms. Gomez has not been listening. There's another video of her burning LGBTQ-themed books with a flamethrower. There's another one in which she urged voters not to be, quote, weak and gay. And now she has filmed a campaign ad on the balcony of the Speaker of the House of Representatives in the Capitol in Washington, where campaign politics is explicitly prohibited by law and by custom. In it, she says something. Ms. Gomez has a fairly standard Colombian sibilant S. So all I ever hear is I'm Valentina and I'm seeking the office of Secretary of State. She's not likely to be in trouble, even though the video boasts about how they don't like her on the speaker's balcony and says she's on the speaker's balcony. And then she shows a picture of herself with an AR-15, of course. But if somebody wants to file an ethics complaint about Speaker Mike Johnson for letting his speaker's balcony be used illegally, well, you know, try to find him. You should first look in a church where he will be pretending to pray. Above that new video shot on the speaker's balcony, Ms. Gomez claims she's, quote, on fire with the truth. Now, I'm going to need to see that video to confirm that optimistic statement. 
runner up. And once again, if you think national Republicans are idiots and psychotics, you really haven't taken a good look at the people they have elected at the state and even the city level. The runner up, worser, George Lang, Ohio State Senator, who now says he regrets the divisive remarks he made in the excitement of the moment on stage, especially in light of the assassination attempt of President Trump last week. We should all be mindful of what is said at political events, myself included. What did he say? I'll play it for you in a moment. First, I'd like to point out that he's an Ohio State Senator. He got the office. He was appointed to it. His background, he was on the zoning board for West Chester Township, and he was a trustee there for 14 years. And he used to work at Procter & Gamble. And it says, quote, Lang is a member of the Boy Scouts of America. What did he say? Oh, nothing. At a J.D. Vance rally, he simply threatened civil war if he doesn't get what he and the other white folk want. Trump and Butler County's J.D. Vance are the last chance to save our country politically. I'm afraid if we lose this one, it's going to take a civil war to save the country, and it will be saved. It's the greatest experiment in the history of mankind. And if we come down to a civil war, I'm glad we got people like uh, Schmidt and the Bikers for Trump on our side. I regret the divisive remarks I made in the... We should all be mindful. Dude, you should be mindful of the fact that if you try to start a civil war, you guys keep forgetting who has all the tanks and bombs. I have a guy of an AR-15. Anybody see it? Yeah, it's over there in that pile of AR-15s from all the guys who were captured. But I, uh, but my, my Second Amendment rights. You're going to jail for the rest of your life, pal. Also, you lost Civil War II. It took an hour and a half. And it was entirely confined to West Chester, Ohio. But our winners, the New York Post and Senator Mike Lee of Utah who led the charge yesterday, the attempt to kill former President Jimmy Carter yesterday. This is a screenshot, apparently, of a Google search of an article that the New York Post posted and then quickly got rid of, and it has the Post logo. We believe it's accurate. And it has the headline, former President Jimmy Carter dead at 99 New York Post, which isn't true. He's not dead. But the synopsis reads, Today, Jimmy Carter, the Georgia peanut farmer who became the 39th president of the United States during a time of gas shortages, Cold War drama, and ellipsis. That's as much as they could get into the Google search. Then they killed it. The New York Post. Post it first. Try to find out if it's real later. Or not at all. New York Post, which, if it were required to make a profit rather than simply massage Rupert Murdoch's ego, i.e. his balls, it would have gone out of business in 1994. Rupert Murdoch and the New York Post, if you ever read something in the New York Post that sounds too good to be true or too bad to be true or simply badly written, you know it's not the truth because it's in the New York Post. And all the good people who work for the New York Post say in the sports department, you are contributing to Rupert Murdoch's attempt to destroy the United States of America. I got into a long argument once with a Post sports writer who says, you're harming my business. And I said, your business is predicated on putting the United States out of business. Well, it's not my department. It doesn't matter if it's not your department. The line... For you to get into hell with the other Rupert Murdoch employees is not going to discriminate between those who worked in sports and those who worked in killing Jimmy Carter in the paper. And by the way, the Post is not the worst. It's only tied for the worst because the worst is Mike Lee, possibly the dumbest man ever to serve in government, including that Lang guy from Ohio. The reason the Post posted what it apparently did and what Mike Lee posted was there was a letter with a faked heading on it. Office of Jimmy Carter dated yesterday's date and Mike Lee simply copied it, pasted it and posted it on Twitter X. Mike Lee at based Mike Lee. Former President Jimmy Carter has died, Mike Lee said. Well, if Mike Lee says it, you know it's not true. It's not true. My thoughts and prayers are with his family. I'll mention this 
in the Reuters article about this disaster by Mike Lee and the New York Post. In response to a request for comment, the owner of the account took credit for creating the fake Jimmy Carter letter, telling Reuters in a direct message, I created it last, that would be Monday night, the amount of misinformation which spread throughout the weekend surrounding the state of President Biden's health was maddening. I wanted to prove that many people on X often spread sensationalist news and headlines without fact-checking or double-checking the source content. You think? The rest of this stuff after the initial former president, Jimmy Carter, James Earl Carter Jr., a.k.a. a passionate champion of human rights, democracy, World War II veteran, blah, 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 with family by his side. President Carter did this. Foreign policy economy, that's the second paragraph. Third of it, domestically, President Carter achievement included installing solar panels on the White House, blah, 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 blah. The fourth one, despite these successes as president, now you think you would have read some of this. Or somebody would have read some of this. No, he's Mike Lee. He has the IQ of a fish, and not a bright fish. Despite these successes as president, all his life, President Carter considered his marriage to former First Lady Rosalind Carter his life's greatest achievement. At her passing last November, President Carter said, Rosalind was a baddie. Jill, Melania, even throat goat Nancy Reagan had nothing on Rosalind. She was the original brat. She gave me wise guidance and encouragement when I needed it. As long as Rosalind was in the world, I always knew somebody loved and supported me. They were married for 77 years. That the question of the quote in here about calling her a baddie or referring to Nancy Reagan as throat goat, that didn't get anybody's attention. That didn't send up a red flag. What was truest? In 1999 is truth today. No oneeth readeth the link. No one clicketh, no one readeth. The New York Post, it's Murdoch, of course it's wrong, and Mike, but but the quote in here from Carter's scholar Owa Tuna Siam, that means it's true, right? Lee. Today's worst persons! Jimmy Carter is not dead in the world! Finally, our number one story in the countdown, things I promised not to tell, and back to my favorite topic, me. I heard Jeff Daniels say the words, and in the next minute, my cell phone rang. It was an ex-girlfriend. While we were talking, an email arrived from another ex-girlfriend, and then in came a text from the current girlfriend at her folks' house. Then two more emails, and before I was off the phone, two voicemails. And then regular friends started to contact me. This is just over 10 years ago now. It was Sunday, August 5th, 2012. Jeff Daniels was playing the controversial newscaster and commentator on Aaron Sorkin's HBO series Newsroom, which was based structurally on me and Countdown. And I know this because Aaron Sorkin told me so before he filmed any of it. And I know this because he asked me if he could base the pilot episode on what happened to me at MSNBC in the spring and summer of 2010. And I know this because he came in and shadowed the staff of Countdown for two days to get the feel for the place. And I know this because he wound up basing one character, Maggie Jordan, on my assistant, Margaret Judson, and then hiring Margaret Judson as a consultant, and then hiring her as an actress to play a part that wasn't supposed to be her. And I know this because he was furious when I would not fly to Denver, I think it was, to do a cameo in the pilot. And I know this because he said he was hiring me as a consultant. And I know this because I never saw a dime out of it. This was the second time Aaron Sorkin had based one of his TV series on one of my TV series. The other was called Sports Night. And Esquire magazine once asked me to interview Sorkin about Sports Night, and I asked him the real tough question. What was the origin of Sports Night? And his answer was, quote, you are the origin. So when the New York Times had called me about Newsroom, I lightheartedly said it was nice to know in advance this time that Aaron Sorkin was making a TV series about me. Sorkin did not like this at all. 
And he told all his actors to tell all their interviewers that this was not true. And I know that because Jeff Daniels told me that that was what Sorkin had told him. Sorkin is interesting. I had known him for about 10 or 12 years when he came into Countdown to see what it looked and felt like. And he was 20 minutes late. And my assistant, Margaret after whom he named Maggie Jordan, whom he then hired away from me, and whom he finally hired as an actress to play Tess Weston, and she was great, by the way. Margaret brings him in, and he apologizes for being late, and he says he's staying in a hotel two blocks away, and he should have just walked, but instead he got in a car. And the next thing he knew, he was six blocks away, caught in traffic caused by the complete shutdown of one of the crosstown streets for midday construction. And I laughed, and I said, well... Like my late father, the architect, used to say, New York, it'll be a great town whenever they finish it. And he laughed, and I laughed. And two years later, in the seventh episode of the HBO Newsroom series, first aired on August 5th, 2012, and re-aired throughout the week, Jeff Daniels as the anchorman Will McAvoy, who wasn't me, but actually kind of was me, is late to his newsroom because he gets caught in Manhattan traffic caused by Sunday night street construction, and he says to his exasperated producer, New York, it'll be a great town whenever they finish it. That's when my phone and email blew up, and the then-girlfriend and like 40% of all of my exes ever all had the same question. New York, it'll be a great town whenever they finish it? Isn't that what your dad used to say? Even the ones who never met my dad knew this because I used to quote him constantly because the real humor in the quote is the fact that my dad was an architect and construction was his business. New York, it'll be a great town whenever they finish it. And then one of the last of the exes reached out. She waited until the show was over. Now, I don't think any of us is proud of this, but she had also dated Sorkin once or twice. And since she had written celebrity stories for a New York newspaper, he had later asked her by email what the world of gossip reporting was like, and she told him by email. And what she now told me made Aaron Sorkin's use of my dad's quote and other parts of my life seem like possible coincidences. She said she was watching the third, maybe fourth episode of Newsroom, and in walked a new character, a gossip columnist, a woman. And the first sentence the character said was... My friend and ex said, word for word, something she had sent to Sorkin in one of the emails about the gossip business. She said when she heard it, her face started to get red, and it would keep getting redder. The gossip columnist character's second line had also been cut and pasted from my ex's email. Then her long speech, then all of her dialogue, she said, in her second scene. My ex actually managed to record that episode and to find her own email to Sorkin and to compare them. And she said, other than changing a couple of tenses, he had used her answers verbatim. I met the actor Josh Charles during the 2000 World Series. I was there anchoring it for Fox Sports. Josh was there promoting his new show on Fox. Josh had played Dan Rydell on Sorkin's Sports Night series, and even Sorkin and I agreed Dan Rydell is just me with a different haircut. I was walking up 6th Avenue one day in October 2000, and from several blocks away, I saw Josh Charles walking towards me. So I had several minutes to prepare what I could say to him. This was not spontaneous, sadly. But after our eyes met and I smiled and he gave me that, yes, I'm on TV look that I recognize and have myself deployed, he switched suddenly to shock and even a little apprehension. And I said the line I had been rehearsing in my head for several minutes. Excuse me, you don't get to say this often in life, but didn't you used to play me on TV? Right there on 6th Avenue, Josh told me about the ordeal of working with and for Aaron Sorkin, and I thought he just meant for actors. But I later found out, because New York, it'll be a great town whenever they finish it. Josh and I are still friends. We've gone to ball games together. We were in a fantasy baseball league together, and one night on my ESPN2 show, we came back from commercial, giving the audience no warning or explanation, and we simply started co-anchoring the show and calling it Sports Night, and making references to the program and to newsroom. And then he said, why did we keep reading this? And I said, I don't know. I just assumed Sorkin had run out of new ideas. The mutual laughter that followed was sincere. There is one more punchline to the newsroom Sorkin story. 
because I was like his seventh guest ever. When Stephen Colbert wrapped up the Colbert Report on Comedy Central, I was invited to be on the final farewell episode. Me and like 99 other people. There were so many of us, ranging from Barry Manilow to Brian Cranston to Big Bird, that they had like nine green rooms in the Comedy Central building. And I get there and they send me to the green room I would be sharing with several other people and I trudge up a bunch of stairs to the top floor and in this big room there is only one other performer there yet. It's Jeff Daniels. Without saying hello, he says, now wait, let me explain. Sorkin told me, and I explained... And then he explained, and then I explained some more, and Jeff said, oh, a lot. And once he said, oops, and Sorkin didn't tell me that. And after about three minutes, he said, so I owe you an apology. And I said, no, you don't. It's not your fault. And he smiled, and he said, well, great, I'm glad. So can we take a picture together that I can put out on Twitter? And I said, yeah, absolutely, but only if you capture it New York. It'll be a great town whenever they finish it. I've done all the damage I can do here. Thank you for listening. Countdown musical directors Brian Ray and John Philip Chanel arranged, produced, and performed most of our music. Mr. Ray was on guitars, bass, and drums, and Mr. Chanel handled the orchestration and the keyboards, and it was produced by TKO Brothers. Other music, including some of the Beethoven, arranged and performed by the group No Horns Allowed. The sports music is the Olbermann theme from ESPN2, written by Mitch Warren Davis, courtesy of ESPN Inc. At this rate, I should just play it for you so you remember what it sounds like. Our satirical and pithy musical comments are by Nancy Faust, the best baseball stadium organist ever, and now my accompanist. My announcer today was my friend Larry David, who does not accompany me anywhere. Everything else was pretty much my fault. That's countdown for this, the 105th day until the 2024 presidential election, the 1,294th day since convicted felon Donald J. Trump, I want to see the manager's first attempted coup against the democratically elected government of the United States. Use the September 18th sentencing hearing. Use the mental health system. You've got it, President Biden. Use presidential immunity to stop him from doing it again while... We still can. And Republicans, please stop shooting at Trump. The next scheduled countdown is tomorrow. Bulletins as the news requires. Till then, I'm Keith Olbermann. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, and good luck. Poland, 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 keep those numbers rolling, get them margins swollen, vice pres. Day three on the stump, already kicking Trump, he wants to see the manager and sue. Two points atop the matchup, now make sure he don't catch up, remember don't vote for the old guy. Thank you, Nancy Faust.